between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Uh, this is part of the Prosper Show e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. They have an awesome conference with some of the top Amazon sellers and industry leaders like we have Michael today. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, which helps service professionals, doctors, lawyers, accountants, coaches, create additional revenue streams and stop just trading time for dollars. We hold you accountable to achieve your biggest goals with a step-by-step roadmap. Go to Rise25.com to learn more. It's run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran. Today, I'm very excited. We have Michael Anderson. He's finally healthy and kicking. He's co-founder of Etail Solutions. They are a multi-channel commerce solution for high-volume merchants. Etail Solutions has a platform, a platform which provides high-volume merchants with a tool set, and the tool set includes online sales channel automation, order management system, global pricing and repricing controls, supplier integrations, product catalog management, and data warehouse reporting. If you have no idea what these things are, you are not a fit for Etail Solutions. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, really Etail Solutions is focused on driving efficiency. So what they do is they allow businesses to scale without having to add staff or increase expenses because their platform does the heavy lifting. Right, Michael? I think that's fair to say, yeah. So the fun fact about Michael is he has twins. <laughs> One, a boy, girl, twins. So, Michael, thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely. Happy to be here. So, one stat, you know, I do a lot of research, and one stat I found is a five-year running average, the average customer who goes on your platform grows 112% in the first year. Yeah. So, what are they doing that's allowing them to grow over 100%? That's a great question. Uh, it is, as you said, it's a stat that we've been tracking now for a number of years. Uh, and of course, as we grow, the number changes a little bit. Um, but it is, um, you know, we attribute it to a few different things. Uh, we do as a platform, we do have some tool sets and some controls that allow people to increase their top line revenue. So we've got a, a, a fully integrated repricing engine, for example, or mm-hmm. some dynamic auto matching capabilities, which, which will help you find additional listings and things like that. And that certainly can impact top line growth. But ultimately, uh, what the platform was really designed to do is to save people time and energy. Um, you know, we all know, and, and most of the merchants who we talk to, they know what they want to do yeah. in terms of they know what to do in the space to grow. And, and quite frankly, it's really not rocket science. I mean, you've, you've got a certain amount of products that you want to be able to sell. Uh, you either expose those products to more eyeballs, meaning you add sales channels, you add more listings, et cetera, um, or you find a way to get more products into your system and, and expose more products to the, to the eyeballs that are out there. So mm-hmm. you add suppliers, you increase your catalog, et cetera. The problem that we keep um, hearing from people that, that they're experiencing is, is is they know what they want to do. They just don't have the time to do it. Yeah. Um, and so, so they want to do all those things. They need they to do sales yeah, channels. Absolutely. They just don't have the capacity to be like, okay, because I noticed on your site, it was like, you know, we help you get on Walmart. So like if they're on Amazon and they're so busy on Amazon, all these other channels, and they want to add Walmart. They just don't have the capacity or time without maybe adding like a full-time staff or something to get on and manage that platform. Right. Yeah. And there's a lot of complexities that come into play as soon as you add that second sales channel. Right. So a lot of folks get started on Amazon and and, uh, that's fairly common. And when you're starting on Amazon, quite frankly, you can you can match your own items. You can kind of deal with order management on your own. Um, One channel is fairly straightforward to manage. But as soon as you add that second channel, now all of a sudden you have to deal with how do I control inventory across these channels? How do I Mm -hmm. deal with the fact that Amazon requires data in a different format and has a different taxonomy than eBay does, than Walmart does, than my Magento site or Shopify site does? Mm -hmm. Um, And organizing and managing all of that data uh, from a single source of truth is ultimately what allows people to scale. and a lot of times people will come to us and they'll have many different systems that they're trying to cobble together. They might have a, 
you know, a standalone repricer. They might have an inventory control solution, a shipping solution, and maybe a couple of other things. Kind of all so, piecemealed together. Yeah, and and that certainly will help people get to a certain level. Um, and quite frankly, we kind of encourage people to do what they can to reach that certain level um, using various systems. But at a certain point in time, um, managing those different systems and trying to deal with the importing and exporting and the and moving data um, to sales channels and from suppliers and all that stuff takes a tremendous amount of time. And it's wasted time that really you can't get back. I mean, an interesting way to look at it is, you know, if you waste just 10 minutes a day doing a repetitive task that could be automated, over the scope of an uh, just an average working year, it's 42 hours. Yeah. 40, that's a week's worth of time that you could Not have been 10 minutes, spending yeah. somewhere else. And that's just 10 minutes for one resource. How many, you know, then you ask the question, well, how many, how many people on your team are wasting time? Uh, and, you know, it adds up really quick. Right. And I encourage people just to get 10 minutes less of sleep also. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of ways to compensate. Here. But then you wake up and you have twins, so you're not getting that time back. Sorry. Right. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things, uh, Michael, is the uh, confusion in the space, right? We were talking before is it's you want to know who's a right fit and then people need, need to know who's not a right fit, right? It saves you and them a lot of time, energy, and money. Um, okay. So talk about, because you don't compete with the Seller Bright, the Scubana, and those companies. Talk about who is the right fit um, for, you know, Etail Solutions. That's a good question. Um, so typically, uh, you know, there's, there are a number of folks who do a really good job working with merchants who are kind of just getting going. And, you know, if people are doing from, you know, call it zero to a hundred thousand dollars in sales a month, um, it's fairly manageable. And some of these tools are very intuitive. They're walk up friendly, they have free trials, uh, and they can do a number of these things that will help people really get off the ground. We actually really prefer when people have used these types of tools before, because, um, our system is, a it's, a it's almost, you could think of it like a multi-channel ERP system, if you're familiar with the concept of ERP, in that it's a very integrated approach to managing the entire business. You know, you've got your master catalog at the core, and we're leveraging that master catalog across all the different channels, um, understanding velocity, dealing with supply chain, and so forth. And it's, it's a very integrated approach to doing business. And any system like that, any enterprise class system, is going to require that there's a certain amount of discipline in the business. Um, you know, I oftentimes will just kind of joke that, you know, it doesn't if if you allow an employee to receive a shipment from a supplier and just put the item on the shelf without checking it in, there's no inventory system in the world that can compensate for that. Right. Right. It's it's a process. It's a discipline type of a thing. And so we really like and appreciate when people have experience with other systems. Um, but oftentimes when people start dealing with multiple sales channels, um, larger catalogs, high order volume, um, multiple fulfillment methods, um, the complexities start to go up quite a bit. And that's when we can really start to leverage some of the efficiencies of a fully integrated system. Um, so yeah. while we do, you know, occasionally on, on opportunities, we'll, somebody will mention somebody like a seller cloud or a Scubana or, or Cellbrite or, or whoever. Um, typically if, if they mention those, we'll just be very upfront and say, well, you know, if you, if those solutions will solve what you need to, to accomplish, and you've done your due diligence and you've kind of run them through their paces and um, and they can solve your problem, you really should go with them. Because quite frankly, if, if their solution is going to be able to solve your need, then we're probably overkill. Um, yeah. And, you know, we, you and I were talking before the call here. Uh, if there's not a good fit between a vendor and a customer, if, if, if there's not a good fit and expectations aren't managed correctly and value is not received, um, that's a waste of time and money for everybody. And, um, you know, I guess we've been doing this now for March 1st will actually be seven years. Um, and we've learned some so pain e lessons. like dog years, that's like 50 years or something? <laughs> well, <laughs> it feels like it sometimes. Right. It does. But, uh, you know, we've learned, we've learned our share of painful lessons in terms of uh, not doing a good enough job on the front end of the sales cycle of, of making sure that there is good fit. And just because somebody's willing to pay the money, it doesn't mean that they're going to receive the kind of value that they need for it to be a long, profitable relationship between the two of you. Yeah. So it takes a little bit of discipline. And sometimes people like myself who are uh, a little tend to lean towards the sales side of the world, you know, we want to go out and get those deals. But um, ultimately, it can cost the company and it costs the customer, which really isn't fair to them. 
uh, right? So if is we there like an average starting size? Like I know you mentioned dollar amounts, like a company yeah. is doing X amount per month that they could start looking at the kind of the robust tool set you have? Yeah, and I, I apologize. I should have run last year's numbers, but 2015's year, uh, numbers, our average starting size was $271,000 a month in sales. Um, I think that's come down a little bit as our customer base has continued to grow. I think we that that number that average has come down. Yeah, so somewhere um, between two hundred and three hundred thousand a yeah, month. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a that's a pretty safe number for last year. Um, so it's definitely people who have experienced a certain amount of success in the industry and kind of have reached that point in time where they recognize um, we've got to get something a little bit more robust in place to be able to scale to that next level without having to scale our staff at the same linear rate as I'm growing the company. Right. So, Michael, you know, you have a robust tool set here, and I'm sure that people who come on and who use ETL solutions don't max out every single one of them. So I'm yeah. curious, what are the two most popular or three most popular of the tools that, you know, when they dive in, like, yes, they're definitely doing the sales automation. They're definitely doing the global, you know, global, re, you know, pricing, repricing. What are the, the, the top two uh, tools that people just love? Um, within the list that I mentioned? Well, I would say over the years, it's funny how you see some trends and you yeah. see the market moving and, uh, and different things are more valuable now than they were before and so forth. But, you know, I would say first, it's important to understand that at our core, what we do extremely well is we manage the relationship between the master SKU. So let's call it this pen as a master SKU in the base unit of measure. So this is an each. We manage that relationship between the master SKU and the many different sales channel listings and or supplier relationships tied to that master SKU. And unit of measure is a, is a component of that. So I could match this one SKU each to an e Amazon, a three pack, a six pack, a 12 pack. And when those sales happen, everything's converted down to that base unit of measure. So now I have complete visibility as to my true velocity for this product. And it make, helps me make smart purchasing decisions, smart pricing decisions, helps me to leverage a centralized catalog across all these channels, et cetera. So that's kind of the, that's the core that that has to be in place. A clean catalog is critical for scalability in this space. So product, we, product cat catalog management is kind of like the foundational. It's the foundation. Thing. So you can't really leverage anything else until you ensure that you've got a nice clean catalog. And, um, and so that's part of the reason why we go through a formal implementation process with our clients is because we've just learned the lesson that if you moved past that stuff too quickly um, and, and don't ensure catalog integrity, um, it's really going to limit the scalability of the business. And then people end up dealing with mistakes and um, exceptions and all that stuff. So that's the core. That's what you have to have in place first. Now, with that said, I would say that um, it's kind of difficult to choose, but I'll just well, go with a couple tell of examples. Me, you know, point. what's interesting, you mentioned trends, right? Yeah. So I'm curious, what's a trending now? And what was tr like, what's an example of something that was trending yeah. before that's not trending as much now? Well, I would say um, year, year, year and a half ago, um, FBA was a massive, massive push, and much more so than it was even a year, year and a half before that. And it's still a very popular thing, but what we're seeing now is um, you definitely need to be able to handle all the FBA functionality, and, and we certainly do that, but um, it's become – the FBA merchants that are out there – I've also realized that just like any good portfolio, financial portfolio, you have to diversify. And yes. so those large FBA merchants are now starting to try to back into, well, what other channel opportunities are there? So that, I would say that was kind of a trend that we've seen. In terms of features that right now are making a massive difference, I would say it's two things. Uh, we did a refactoring of our repricing engine this last year. Um, and it, it involves the ability now to leverage a lot of additional data um, data that we're collecting as a result of some of the other features in our platform, like our replenishment engine, does nightly calculations on velocity. Um, so we could do things like, uh, let's say, for example, that you're a private labeler and uh, you buy 10,000 units of stock and you want to send it to FBA. Well, we all know that if you don't move that inventory in time, you're going to be subject to long-term storage fees. So the repricer now has the ability to consider things like velocity and certain mm, dates. So they can example. get rid of it before you get hit up with the, all these fees type of thing. Yeah, so we, we yeah. could monitor the, the calculated velocity. And if, if uh, inventory goes below a certain level, let's say, um, we could affect the price in whatever way that you want to to drive additional yeah. velocity and move prices up and down in relation to that. So there's some really interesting things there. 
but also we refactored it from a performance perspective. Um, our largest client right now has a little more than 9 million um, SKUs and over 70 million okay. listings across a dozen channels. And so in their particular scenario, they've got a lot of different Amazon accounts in different categories, all with Amazon's approval. Um, but we're receiving you know, price notifications from Amazon to the clip of north of $3 million an hour uh, for them. And after you get rid of duplicates and prioritize and so forth, anywhere from 500000 to a million price updates every single hour for them, which, yeah. you know, it was – a few years ago, it was you know up to a hundred thousand, and that was a big number. What were but, they doing before this? Like, uh, how did they even? How did you even manage? Begin to manage nine million SKUs? Uh, well, they had they had built their own system, and ultimately, and um, then like it blew up and went on fire, like after like a day. It, you know, they they had done a fairly good job. I have to give credit where credits due. Mm-hmm. They had done a fairly good job, but it was as as many sort of homegrown systems kind of uh, they're they're built to function, they're built to purpose. But then what people realize down the road is they may have painted themselves into a corner. Um, we just did another deal here recently, a fairly sizable merchant um, doing about $18 million a year or so. And they had built their own system over the last 10 years, did a lot of supplier integrations, a lot of the stuff that we do, um, very functional, but it was built specifically for Amazon. And to add another sales channel would have been a massive amount of I work see. for it. It was a concept that they just had never built for. Yeah. So, so you just keep kind of building on top of it. And when you get to the top, it's like, well, this is this building's for Amazon. Now we have to build a whole separate one for Walmart or something like that or yeah. connect in, something. In their case, the concept of multi-channel just was not something yeah. they could deal with. So that's one thing. And then the other thing that I was going to mention is um, we rolled out uh, what we're calling the dynamic auto matcher this last year. And, you know, everybody's been able to just upload a spreadsheet to Amazon and match to ASINs, um, you know, for years, right? But the quality of those listings uh, or the matches, it's all dependent upon the the data that the original merchant loaded into Amazon in the first place. And so um, we've sort of, we've taken our tool set and we're allowing um, the, the matcher that we've built to leverage other attributes within the matcher and then automatically perform certain actions based upon the quality of the match. So we can automatically match to a listing, let's say, if the UPC matches and the manufacturer's part code matches and prices within 10% of what we would sell it for, then we would automatically um, create the listing, publish inventory, publish a price, and start selling because it's a very high-quality match. Then we might find a scenario where, let's say, a UPC matches, manufacturer's part code matches, uh, but the price is above that 10% threshold. It might still be a great match, but maybe the UPC is off. Or I'm not sorry, sorry, the unit of measure is off. Maybe mm-hmm. it's a three pack or a six pack. Right. Um, and so in those scenarios, we can have the auto matcher just say, okay, we're going to create the listing internally, but we're not going to publish any inventory until somebody verifies it. So once somebody verifies it, then they will turn around and publish. Um, and the, the quality has been, has, has gone through the roof being able to do things like this, as well as um, the results. Quite frankly, we had one merchant um, in the middle of September who we turned this on for, and they had around 200,000 listings at the time. Uh, we more than doubled that, so they were north of 400,000. And within the three and a half months between the time we turned that on and the end of the year, they had incrementally another $6.9 million worth of sales off of the new listings that we created. Wow. So um, that one's that one, as you can imagine, has been fairly popular to, <laughs> with our customers as we're starting to roll that out across our base. So go back, Michael, to the beginning, right? Yeah. What's the original idea? Well, um, so I mean, obviously life. you didn't start with like 20 tool sets and a thousand, you know, developers programming yeah. this stuff. Where did it, where did it start? Yeah. So in a past life, I was a vice president at an ERP software company. Okay. And, uh, the, the niche that we had was, uh, was kind of dealing with e-commerce distributors, I would say, uh, because it had an integrated e-commerce engine, um, that was powered by ASP.NET storefront. And so, you know, we would find ourselves in these situations with merchants in, in this is kind of the 2008-ish type of time frame where, um, you know, people were asking questions about, okay, well, I want a B2C site, but I also want a B2B site. So they've got multiple websites. Or, you know, eBay had been around for a while. Amazon was just starting to come onto its own as a marketplace. And people are saying, well, how do, how do I deal with this? And then, oh, on top of that, you know, I have a really large catalog, but I, I sell, I drop ship off of these four or five suppliers. And there really just was nothing on the market that was dealing with that as an integrated concept. You know, uh, Channel Advisor. Because it's complicated. <laughs> yeah, it is complicated. I mean, I mean, Channel Advisor, to give credit where credit's due, I mean, they're kind of a pioneer in the space and they've been around for a long time. 
um, but they're really they're they're a listing engine, and they can help you get out of these different um, sales channels. And, Do you get compared a lot to Channel Advisor? We run into them on a lot of deals, yeah. but we are we're an operational platform. We're an execution platform. Uh, we were built to be transactional at the very beginning. So, as opposed to being able to just publish onto these different channels, and and then you know once the order happens, it's kind of your problem to deal with. We actually we're full blown OMS. So. We deal with pick, pack, ship, drop, ship, cross, dock, FBA, third-party logistics providers. We can do some fairly advanced order routing uh, based on how that order needs to be fulfilled. Um, and so we take ownership of the entire process, and that's the big differentiator. So if people are just looking for an advanced listing engine, then uh, you know Channel Advisor might be a decent choice. If they're looking for operational efficiency and wanting to be able to scale the business without having to add people at that same linear rate as we discussed then um, we we win those deals pretty handily. So you're you know so you're VP and you're seeing all these issues. Yeah. So what do you do? Yeah. So um, I had started a project with a, a developer buddy of mine, kind of a nights and weekends type of a thing. Yeah. And um, just to kind of see if we could pull this off uh, as a concept. And was the that original, the original idea? Like, what was that original concept? The original concept was this for this to be really a bit more of like a QuickBooks Plus type of a a solution, you know, bolt onto QuickBooks, fairly simplistic and so forth. Um, I won't go into all the details, but essentially, you know, it kind of came to the point where the ERP company I was working with um, uh, was being sold. I put in a bid to buy it with a, a financial partner out east, and mm. um, we got outbid by a company in California. And, and I oftentimes will tell people that was the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, because it kind of, it forced my hand to either, I could go with the company, they wanted me to come along, or I could kind of chase this dream. And um, after talking with this partner out east, he um, he had tried to be successful in the multi-channel space and had had struggled with that himself. But he um, he had a, a friend of his who had five Amazon accounts and three eBay accounts and a website and was trying to figure this out as well. And um, so I flew out east and we were able to land a fairly sizable deal that helped helped us get the foundation in place. We kept the intellectual property and um, quite frankly, you know, through the first year and a half, uh, as you can imagine, was heavy, heavy development. But right. We were dealing with a lot of these base concepts. They needed to deal with drop shipping. They needed to deal with the one to many listings of multiple ASINs for the same SKU. Um, they were selling um, footwear, so different sizes, different colors, uh, sort of the, of the pool yeah. as far as data goes. I mean, it was not. Yeah. There's some challenges. So you stuff. advise no one go into that type of business? Well, um, yeah. it, let's just say hindsight uh, would maybe be pointing me in a different direction. But, yeah. um, you know, in the end, it was a really good it was a good thing because it taught us a lot of the you know, the complexities that we needed to right. solve it caused us to build the foundation in such a yeah. way that we could deal with the, the one to many relationships and deal with transactional automation uh, as opposed to just sort of downloading the order and then making it the merchant's problem to deal with. Now we can make intelligent decisions based upon the data itself as to how to route it, mm -hmm. you know, who's, what's the cheapest method of fulfillment, all those types of things. And so, um, so anyway, we we uh, we landed that opportunity. Um, ultimately, we started to grow. I did some basic YouTube videos, which I quite frankly I think they're still out there. Uh, in my basement in Mankato, Minnesota, just waiting, watched them. <laughs> and, and talking about what we did and the problems we were solving. And we just started getting phone calls. And uh, you know, here we are close to seven years later. And, um, you know, we're we're blessed. So how did you get that first customer to believe in you? Well, I mean, the relationship that this individual, you know, this partner out east that I had, um, you know, who's no longer with the business at this point, but the relationship he had, I think, certainly uh, brought some credibility to the table. Um, but ultimately, uh, I, I think, you know, at the time, we wouldn't, if we're truly honest about it, I mean, we were selling a vision. We were selling what we right. thought we could build, Yeah, exactly. Um, based upon this proof of concept. Um, and I think ultimately, it does kind of come back to your willingness to say no or just to be transparent about limitations. Uh, I think, uh, you know, at, at the end of the day, he trusted us enough to move forward. And uh, I, I think that our backgrounds in, in dealing with enterprise class solutions and the fact that we dealt with a lot of these challenges in different mm -hmm. environments, um, I think brought some credibility. Um, that original build out of the, uh, the solution, um, yeah. what did you have to start with? Or did they require all of these things 
um, in that initial solution than you had them for, for future customers. Like what were the uh, few major ones maybe they were requesting um, initially? Well, initially, ironically, they wanted to build a marketplace. So they had these marketplace, uh, you know, the Amazon and eBay accounts and so forth, but they wanted to build, um, they wanted to build their own marketplace. And um, ultimately, about midway through the project, decided uh, to switch directions and then start dealing with Amazon and, and eBay and so forth. And so um, the marketplace never really came to fruition. Um, the change in direction kind of pointed us more towards digging into to the uh, the marketplaces themselves, and it was kind of the base requirements of has to be you know has to be multi-channel has to be able to manage multiple listings per individual SKU, um, had to be able to deal with unit and measure differences, um, had to once that down the order was downloaded we had to know how to deal with it so we had to to build some order routing and some hold codes and things like that, uh, it's it sort of set the pattern to be honest in terms of how our platform has grown which is. Um, working with merchants to solve these real-world problems. Um, it's not until recently that we really have added a, a vice president of, of product management to the organization. Up until now, we've grown based upon uh, the needs of our clients and them defining, look, we've got a complex problem. If we could if we could do X, Y, or Z, we could save two hours a day. Well, chances are good if one merchant needs that, then a whole bunch of them need it. And so the, you know, I have to give a lot of credit to my partner, Clyde Siegel, our CTO, in that He's always kind of taking these. You're pro- like, here's a list, Clyde. Good luck. Like, these, well, we need this built this month. He's honestly, don't he, sleep. He's hands down one of the best skunk works guys I've, I've ever been blessed to work with. And you could throw him into the middle of a problem and he always figures, figures his way out. Right. Uh, matter of fact, I've got some funny stories about that. But the, um, you know, the reality is we, he especially has always taken the approach of, you know, when we go, when we get introduced to a problem, you know, it'd be very easy to just build a quick hack and, and fix a problem for a client. It's much harder to take a step back, and it takes longer, quite frankly, to take a step back as a software company and say, how do we build this in such a way that it's a feature that everybody can benefit from, not just one merchant? Right. Um, how do you make it configurable and flexible and so forth? So um, I think that was also a key to our ability to maintain the growth that we yeah. had. Yeah, Michael, you were talking about trends, and um, you see a lot of sellers. I'm curious of what you see some of the biggest mistakes that they're making. Uh, You know, at the core of the core, uh, if I can say it that way, the ability to scale in a multi-channel world is, as I mentioned before, it's all about the catalog and it's all about inventory management. Yeah. Um, A really simplistic example would be, okay, so let's say that I've got 10 units of this pen, um, and I've got, let's say, uh, three Amazon listings and an eBay listing and a website listing. So that's five different listings for a single SKU. The question comes down to, well, what do I, what do I publish to each of those? Do I publish 100% of what I have? Because if so, I just told the world I've got 50 when I've only got 10, right? So dealing with the concepts and giving people the tools to be able to, to do partial allocations to individual listings or channels doing mins and maxes, giving them the tool set to be able to deal with that is important. But inventory management tends to be the uh, the gateway conversation, if you will, that a lot of people bring to us. And, and when you ask them, well, what's your major pain point? What problem are you trying to solve? They'll start with inventory management. But inventory management is a, the problem of inventory management is a symptom of so much uh, uh, so many other pieces of the organization, right? Because sales orders, right? Complete inventory purchases, bring up inventory transfers, adjustments, um, shrinkage, all those different things affect your inventory. So you kind of have to have visibility on the sales side and the purchasing side, as well as basic inventory management capabilities in order to do that effectively. And then you got to also deal with all the challenges of selling across these different channels. So, um, I would say that, yeah, inventory is, is probably the biggest issue that they come to us with. Yeah, because I would think that, um, the, like you said, there's a lot of different issues that can come about. Well, if you don't sell, sell fast enough, then you're sitting on all this inventory, and yeah. then you have to manage more. But then, let's say you get uh, a bunch of sales instantly, and now you got to you know, put in capital yeah. to buy it. Yeah. Yeah, I, we've seen a number. You so you ask about sort of merchant mistakes. We've seen a number of scenarios where people have gotten out over their skis and and had poor inventory management practices. 
Uh, they think just because it's a high moving skew that they should buy, mm. you know, a container load of something. They projected um, it and then they just then, bought too much. Well, and it might even be a fast moving product, but if you're tying up your cash for eight months before you get a return on that cash, you know, you got to pay, you got to make payroll, you got to pay your utilities, you know, all those other things. And we've just seen a number of folks just get, um, uh, too much of their cash tied up in inventory and it cripples their business. So knowing what to buy and how much to buy and how frequently to buy uh, is is a critical component as well of being successful and being able to scale. Oh, yeah. Um, there was another case. Uh, I want you to talk about a few uh, interesting stories, uh, case studies. Um, okay. And there was a husband and wife, I think, that came to you. And I don't know if it was their motto. It was like never own inventory. Uh, that was, was actually it? a different customer. Oh, that was different. They, okay. I mean, they, they fit that mold, quite frankly. So uh, it's a company called Olivabel, actually, and we've done a, a case study, and he's okay with us using his name. Um, and you can Google it. Uh, there's, there was kind of a, a heartwarming story about how he got started, and Amazon did a case study on him. You know, he uh, was affected by Hurricane Katrina way back when and, uh, and started drop shipping on Amazon to support his family and the business started growing. And, and Oliva Bell is actually the name, it's a combined combination of his two daughters' names. Mm. Uh, so nice. heartwarming story, but he came to us and he was doing about, um, well, he was doing about 65 K or so, um, and, uh, uh, a month in sales. And he was doing all of this via just manual order management. He was drop shipping from one major supplier and getting the file and massaging it, uploading it to, to Amazon and doing that a few times a day right. and then dealing with 50, 60 manual purchase orders every single day and then getting tracking information and trying to put it up there. So um, we, when we engaged, not a lot of automation, that, no, none. And so he recognized that he needed to kind of make an investment in that uh, area, but the, based on his size, it was kind of a big deal for him to make that investment. Um, but we, what we did is we, so we integrated the catalog, so we automated the price and availability feed. Uh, we integrated the supplier; they they could work with EDI, so we've got a fully functional EDI subsystem, so we can deal with the the purchase orders and receiving the tracking information back. We automated a lot of the the matching and the publishing out to the different you know, out to Amazon at the time it was the only place he was selling. Turned on repricing, gave him access to our matching tool at the time. And um, all of a sudden, so instead of spending four to six hours doing manual POs every day, he didn't have to worry about any of the order management, just the exceptions. And so he just turned it into an animal um, going out there and matching the listings. So the supplier had a fairly good sized catalog and he would go out and he'd find four or five, six mm. listings, you know, not just matching on UPC, but matching on description. And, and he just he just really expanded his his uh, catalog. So and his he listings can that compare day. to what what was being sold on Amazon currently. Yeah, he would. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So he would just match to that. Um, you know, you fast forward a few years and uh, he's got many different suppliers that are integrated now. He's selling on Amazon, Canada and eBay. Um, and um, just recently, uh, he just celebrated his first million dollar month. So wow. um, and it's just uh, he uh, he is him is his wife and I think another halftime person. So two and a half people are running that business. Wow. So it gave him the time to really increase the number of listings and increase the channels as well, mm -hmm. essentially. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. So there's another person, and um, they went from they were doing ninety, uh, almost a hundred thousand a month, mm -hmm. and now I think you said they were doing six and a half million. Um, I'm, what did they do to grow? I know you can't talk about the specifics about this person because they didn't give you approval, but what yeah. what were some of the things that they did uh, to actually grow? Yeah, so yeah, they were start they started out with us at ninety five k a month, and um, as you said, they're they're doing between six and a half and seven million a month at this point. Oh. Um, I can't even talk about the industry because it's a it's a highly they're, competitive right. space that they're, <laughs> they're in. They're all highly competitive. No one wants to talk uh, about the industry. Yeah, nobody. Well, and that's funny because we get the down low high five all the time of you know considered we're considered kind of a secret weapon and people don't want to talk about it so right. it's kind of a backhanded right compliment. it's interesting because how do you generate referrals when people obviously they don't want to tell the competition about you yeah but we honestly we've fallen behind in really trying to do that until just recently we're starting to do um more case studies and, and some folks are willing to use their name other folks are, are willing to say you know go ahead and use all the data just you know keep me anonymous and uh but we'll, we'll do what we can but 
Yeah, in this case, because um, six and a half million per month is yeah, serious volume. Yeah, yeah, um, and that's taken him. You know, that was probably about four, four and a half years or so um, that he's grown to that with us. Uh, you know, it's a lot of things. Um, there's um, there's quite a bit of cross. So so we deal with multiple fulfillment methods. Um, so you know, a certain amount of stuff is in stock and they can ship from stock. A lot of times, in order to grow to that size, you really need to expand your catalog offering. And so you want to leverage your supplier's inventory. So that can involve uh, setting up drop shipping relationships or it can involve cross stocking, which is essentially kind of ordering on demand. So you can leverage your supplier's inventory get a price and availability feed, publish that inventory for sale. Then when the orders happen, you can kind of queue those up through the day, do a bulk PO to the supplier. They ship you the goods the next day, you send it to the end customer. And we've mm. built some some very efficient tool sets to do that. So he started leveraging his supplier's inventory. And then as FBA started to get more and more popular, um, he, uh, to his credit, has, has built a phenomenal team around him to really uh, dig into what products make sense to go deep on, and in some so ways, he may test them with like leverage supplier inventory before putting up a bunch of capital, then see exactly. which ones actually sell volume, and then those ones he'll invest the capital and ship them to FBA and increase the the volume on them. Essentially, you nailed it. You nailed it. And we're we're seeing a lot more of that um, now, where people that's really want smart. To, to, well, it is. I yeah. mean, you get you get access. You're to just testing without yeah, you're putting testing. up any money. Now, the the only downside to that is is that. Um, if you if you only focus on that from the perspective of what's moving, what am I selling? That can be a little bit of a misnomer because if you're drop shipping, your cost basis is not going to be as low as if you are buying in bulk and sending to FBA. Sure. Um, so. But that's the price you uh, pay for testing and not putting up capital, right? But you have to look at it this way. Look, if I'm able to do a, quite a bit of volume on these hundred SKUs and I'm drop shipping, what more could I do if I had that at, at FBA and how much right. more money could I make? Yeah. So, you know, I would say for him, it's a combination of really growing his catalog with a number of supplier integrations, um, focusing on leveraging FBM fulfillment in all of its different forms in order to do multi-ace and matching, um, but then doing smart sourcing and really taking advantage of sort of the FBA bandwagon uh, and all the benefits yeah. that that can bring. Yeah. So, Michael, um, again, you see a lot of companies, a lot of trends. I'm curious if you see something, whether it's a product that no one else is doing right now that you um, you it's maybe like if you were in the space of being a seller, if you were to give away an idea, um, what would you say? Like no one's executing on this necessarily. So you're not giving away anything in particular, but like, I think I have this really good idea for this, whatever it is. Cause I'm sure you are um, your creative juices are always like kind of bubbling in your head. Are there any um, ideas that you can give away that none of your sellers who are on your platform are actually selling now that you think would be uh, interesting to test on the market? You know, there's n honestly nothing really comes no. to mind. I, I would tell you if it did, but you know, our sellers, our, our product was built in such a way that it's not specific to a, a niche as it yeah. were. Like, so no, we I'm have, just curious, have, you know, like yeah, no, you see a, a lot of things come through your desk and I'm sure you're like, you know, if there was just this widget, then no one's doing it, but. Yeah, not yet. I would say, though, as a general rule, um, the people that we see are successful, um, almost always it has to do with a unique strategy around sourcing. Um, I always tell people, you know, hmm. we can turn on sale with, with repricing engines and so forth. You can turn on sales like a spigot these so, days with yeah. the right platform. But it's how you buy and what makes you unique in your supply chain that ultimately allows you to scale yeah. the business. Yeah, so that's interesting. Unique, yeah, unique manufacturers uh, in products that, you know, when people need them, they really need them. So maybe some long tail stuff if you can leverage that inventory where it sits versus taking ownership of it. Uh, but now there's there's no individual product that comes to mind, unfortunately. What would be an example of a unique source? A unique sourcing example. Um, we've got a guy who, uh, well, man, I got to be careful here. I I, I don't want to get you in so, trouble. Yeah, no, I, I'm – so things that you might not necessarily think of as high-volume things, uh, you know, uh, tires, uh, and, and not big tires, but like bike tires or, 
you know, things things that don't necessarily come to mind when you think about, you know, hot moving products. Let's be honest, there's the the especially with the major distributors out there um, who are in the consumer electronics and office products and so forth. That space is completely saturated. Right. And the margins are just so narrow. Right. But if you can find products that, like I said, when people need them, they really need them. And if you can be the best source of those products, um, you can do a tremendous amount of business. And we've seen some really unique stuff. And I quite frankly, those are kind of the, some of the secret sauces of our merchants. So I, I don't think I can really go there. But um, I have I to ask say, the question, though, you know. Yeah, so. no. I, just if you're looking for sourcing ideas, I would just say go to local, go to local trade shows where you're going to yeah. run into local manufacturers who may have figured out an awesome little product, but just don't know how to kind of capture and take advantage of right. a global. They haven't gone online type of thing. And negotiate to yeah. be their exclusive distributor. Um, we see that as a trend um, that's that's really picking up some speed where. Merchants themselves are positioning themselves as really providing a marketplace management service and using that, going to the brands directly and just saying, hey, look, I know you don't really maybe aren't capturing Amazon or eBay revenue or maybe don't have any desire to do that. And you can't because it'll create cut channel conflict with your existing customers. Let us do that for you. And right. it's a one off transaction. Right. Uh, we'll split the profits. Those types of arrangements they are happening all the time right now. Uh, and I think it's a great strategy. I think we've mm -hmm. been seeing it work. So that leads me to, so what conferences that you like to recommend? Obviously, and you know, we talked about the Prosper Show. What other conferences, e-commerce uh, conferences, or maybe sourcing conferences that you either have attended or you heard are good? Uh, so I will say James and team, uh, the Prosper Show, they, they, it was a first-year show this last year. I thought it was really, really well done. Um, that, uh, so I'm looking forward to going to that one again and, and we'll have a 10 by 20 booth there. Um, you know, we, we go to IRC every single year, uh, in June. It's one of these shows where you kind of just, once you start going, you kind of almost have to be there and, and people expect you to be there. Um, the return on investment is probably iffy one way or yeah. the other. It's a huge exhibition. I mean, they have like, what, like 800 massive. or 900, um, booths or something. Probably, yeah. Maybe more. Yeah. I, think, I mean, it's thousands and thousands and thousands of people, yeah. um, ranging from you know big corporations to individual you know sole proprietors. But it's a it's a great place for us to meet with merchants, meet meet with prospects, meet with a lot of our customers. Now go to that. So so we use it in a lot of different ways, and you know we'll oftentimes you know schedule meetings with customers around that and so forth. So um, that one we're there. We're at that one every year. Um, that's been a fairly decent show. Um, I've been to a number of other ones um, over the years. Um, I'll be honest, for our particular clients, the people that we work with really well, mm -hmm. um, we're finding other sources of, of uh, getting in touch with those people that are, frankly, more cost effective than trade shows. So, right. you know, for our, our strategy as a company, we probably will start to lean away from some of, you know, just going to a lot of shows. And, and start really focusing more on a couple of specific shows every single year, but then investing our, our efforts in, in getting in touch with merchants in other ways. Yeah. No, Michael, this has been hugely valuable. I appreciate you sharing your insights. I have uh, two more questions, but people sure. should check out etailsolutions.com. Are there any other places we should point them towards online or specifically on your site? Uh, you know, I guess it really just has to do with what their what their needs are. Um, I will say this: we, especially with sort of all of the banging our heads against the wall we've done over the last seven years of learning who we can best serve, uh, we're very transparent with people. If we can help them, um, we'll we'll certainly pursue that. Um, if we're not a good fit, uh, we've got relationships with other providers out there as well, and we've we've certainly referred business to other providers. So if we're not a good fit, if it's too early for us, I'd rather see some people go and be successful with another platform, and then maybe someday work with us yeah. than to have a bad relationship. So, you know, if you've got questions, the best thing I can say is you know certainly read up on us on our site or watch our videos, but just reach out to us, and we'll just have an honest conversation and see if there's a fit or not. Yeah. So check out etailsolutions.com. So first question, Michael, is what have we missed with the Etail Solutions story? We've talked a lot about different <laughs> topics. What uh, have we missed anything? I don't think so. You know, just yeah. like many software companies, you kind of you go through a lot of learning curves as you grow and and stretching the organization. And uh, you know, we're 
as an organization, we're really investing a lot of time and energy right now in customer success. Um, and customer success is a fairly popular topic in the SaaS industry overall, but um, it's it's really just a change in mindset of, you know, we need to be, instead of being reactive to clients, we really need to be proactive. And so doing things like regular account meetings and um, and talking about not just, hey, what do you want us to do? Because at that point, we're just executing against the customer's plan, which may work in some scenarios, but asking the question of where do you want to go over the next one to three years and helping, you know, do you want to drive 10% growth next year or 200%? Because we can suggest different services or help you in different ways, dramatic in dramatically different ways than if you want to maintain revenue versus if you want to be aggressively grow. Um, so I would say that's probably the biggest thing that, that we've learned, you know, over the years that we're really focusing on right now is customer success and partnering with our clients. Um, Having because, more you know, specific meetings about, yeah. strategy we've learned i mean we've just learned so much about how we can leverage tools and where right. the opportunities are and so forth and we've just learned that you know as an organization the merchants that really grow are the ones that we yeah. can have that really close working relationship with mm -hmm. and we're kind of just in the best scenarios we're considered just an extension of their team and and that really causes a lot of good things to happen yeah are you seeing as far as opportunities that you mentioned you know, obviously there's the Amazons and Walmarts. What are some of the lesser known ones that people should be looking at? Well, um, obviously not lesser known, but you, you mentioned Walmart. I would say that that is that was a huge push this last year and continues to be this year. Um, they're growing very aggressively. Um, it's definitely something if you're not on Walmart, you should really consider trying to figure that out and, and get on Walmart. You know, another thing, um, for the last couple of years, we've been working with the eBay Strategic Merchant Group, which not a lot of folks know about. Mm -hmm. um, and by definition, that group is looking for merchants who are doing more than a million dollars annually somewhere else on the web. Um, and less than 5% of their sales are based upon eBay sales as of today. Right. And that group is a group of salespeople, which, believe it or not, is a good thing. Um, and they're tasked with, with sort of re-embracing people who may have been on eBay in the past and were yeah. disenchanted for whatever reason. Um, but that group can do some really phenomenal things. And, and we've been working closely with them over the last year and a half or so. And by definition, see people go from less than 5% of their, their GMV on eBay to sometimes 15, 20, 30% of their total GMV now on eBay because of this group. They can waive listings in certain categories. They can rapidly raise your selling limits. They can get you involved in deal, daily deal promotions. Um, and so that's been a really good relationship that we find not a lot of people know is out there. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so that's... Um, Thank you. Yeah, that's good. That we want, sure. Love that. So last question, Michael, and I'm always curious about this for uh, selfish reasons too. I'm wondering um, what your, your schedule looks like and how you... I don't like the term balance family and business because it's it's always a tough one. But how do you integrate the family side with the business side? Because obviously you have a growing company and there's a lot that's involved in the company. But you mm -hmm. have twins um, and family too. So mm -hmm. how does that all integrate together? What does your schedule look like? Well, I, you know, I, I've got a fairly interesting story that way. And I'll, I'll try and be brief. But, yeah. you know... Uh, you know, my wife and I had had some trouble having the kids that we did, and um, we lost a couple along the way. Mm, and sorry to hear um, that. Jeez. Yeah, and it, but ultimately, you know, we we had the twins. Um, it was a difficult labor. They were born at 30 weeks um, after six weeks of hospital bed rest, and Jeez. you know, so so we got. I mean, God really blessed us. We we we've uh, we've got a boy and a girl. I get to see the differences between boys and girls real time. But, you know, we're kind of two and out. And so for me, <laughs> yeah. um, for me, it's it's I only get one shot at this in terms of raising kids and, and our kids are our legacy. And, right, um, right. and so for me, I've always kind of maintained uh, that, you know, when it comes to the end of the workday, whenever the workday sort of naturally wraps up five thirty six, whatever that is between that time and the time my kids go to bed, I'm off limits and. You know, I'll, in all likelihood, I'm going to open up my laptop and putz on something after the kids go to bed. But right. that that one thing, I think, has, has allowed me to maintain some level of balance. Um, I'll be honest, doesn't always mean that mentally I'm present. Sometimes that's a difficult balance to maintain. But right. um, for me, that uh, sort of the, the, the whole experience that we went through with these children and, and the fact that uh, – 
they're they're what I've got. Um, and I only get one chance at this. It's not like I've got an older kid and a younger kid, and I can do better the second time around. Um, they're going at it at the same it. time. So, yeah. Yeah. So that that really has helped at least provide me some some perspective as well as uh, uh, you know, my faith is fairly important to me as well. And yeah. so that that all kind of weighs into it. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That's that sounds really difficult. And uh, it sounds like carving that time out between your, you know, when you get back and when they go to bed is just the ultimate importance. So, yep. Yeah. Yep, it is. Michael, thank you. I really appreciate it. And everyone should check out Etail Solutions. It's E T A I L Solutions.com. And uh, if anyone's going to the Prosper Show, you should uh, say there. hi. You'll be there. Team will be there. Etail Solutions will be there. Yep. So thanks, Michael. Appreciate All it. All right. Thanks, Jeremy. Appreciate it. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out.